Good morning, everybody. I'm glad to see you. Um, this is the beginning of American Education Week here at the School of Education, and we have a series of four presentations that will relate to neuroscience and. Um, and this morning, we're starting off with neuroscience and reading. Our two presenters are Catherine Compton Lilly and Mark Seidenberg. Catherine is an associate professor in curriculum instruction here on campus. She teaches courses in literacy studies and works in the professional Devel development schools in Madison. Among the books that she's edited or co-authored are Reading Families, The Literate Lives of Children, published by Teacher College, Teachers College Press, Rereading Families, published by Teachers College Press, and Reading Time, The Literate Lives of Urban Secondary Students and Their Families. In the book, she describes the experiences of following her own eight former uh, first grade students through middle school. And she's currently writing about what those students are doing now that they are in high school. Dr. Compton Lilly has, co has authored articles in Reading Research Quarterly, Research and Teaching English, The Reading Teacher, Journal of Early Education, Early Childhood Literacy, The Reading Teacher, and The Language Arts. Dr. Compton Lilly engages in longitudinal research projects that last over a long period of time. Obviously, if she's following the same kids since uh, they were in her elementary ed classroom. Her interests include examining how time operates as a contextual factor in the children's lives as they progress through school and construct their identities as students and teachers and readers. In a current ongoing study, Dr. Compton Lilly is working with a team of graduate students to follow 15 children of immigrant families from primary school through high school. She is currently the editor-in-chief of Networks, an online journal for teacher research. That's Kathy. Mark, can you stand up, Mark? Mark Seidenberg is a Hildale professor and Donald O. Hebb professor in the Department of Psychology here on this campus. Dr. Seidenberg is a psychologist in a cognitive neuroscience who studies language and reading with the goal of understanding how these skills are acquired and used and the brain circuits that support them. His reading research addresses the nature of skilled reading, learning to read, dyslexia, and the brain basis of reading. He uses behavioral experiments, computational models, and neuroimaging as his, as his basis for research. His current interests include the impact of dialectical, or I'm sorry, the impact of dialect differences on reading acquisition and the achievement gap, and trade-offs between languages and the writing system that represent them. His research on language is focused on the nature of linguistic knowledge, especially inflectional and derivational morphology, and the role of statistical learning and language acquisition. And that's what I want to talk more about to you, Mark. I don't understand that one. He's, he is writing a general audience book about reading, which he hopes to contribute to bridging the gap between cognitive neuroscience and cognitive science and educational practice. I welcome both of these two individuals, and I'm thrilled to be able to present this initial foray into neuroscience and education. Well, I'm very pleased to be here today, and I'm especially pleased to be here with Mark. Um, I think it's going to be a wonderful morning. And um, I want to talk to you about what this might mean for teachers and what teachers might do with some of the information we have from neuroscience. But I have to tell you, you notice Cheryl did not tell you I was a neuroscientist, and I'm not. I'm actually very far from a neuroscientist. I'm a teacher, and um, I've been a teacher for a long time. I taught first grade for 18 years before I came to the university, so I spent most of my life with kids who are much smaller than you folks. And I worked especially with struggling readers, kids who were the lowest of the um, children based on assessment, uh, assessments in first grade, and worked with them trying to catch them up to the reading level of their peers in their classrooms. Um, when I came to UW-Madison, I worked as a reading recovery trainer. I was a trainer for the state of Wisconsin for um, seven years. For, um, and worked with helping teachers and school districts work with teachers to be excellent teachers of kids who struggle with reading. So I've worked both in the professional development capacity and as a teacher myself, helping struggling readers. Um, over this time, I have probably um, taught over 100 children to read, especially children who struggle. So I've got a lot of experience in that world. But I have to tell you that the major challenge that I faced over all those years is this idea of the black box. That when you're teaching reading, there's only certain things you can see and understand, or at least until recently. What is actually going on in kids' heads is very hard to understand when you're um, teaching real live children who are sitting in front of you. So some of the things we've been able to look at 
is we've been able to look at the behaviors that we see children actually doing. So we can pay attention to the ways they look at print, the ways their eyes scan text, the ways they decode words. So when they're looking at a word, where in that word are they looking? Are they looking at the letters in the middle? Are they starting at the end of the word when they try and read that word? What are they doing? We can think about how they look at the pictures and what they draw from the pictures. Early readers spend a lot of time moving between the picture and the text trying to help construct meaning. So we can think about that. We can think about what kids say about the books they read. What do they understand? What can they talk about? What don't they understand? So these are the outward behaviors that we can think about. And one of our primary tools in classrooms has been to document children's reading behavior. So we listen to kids read, and we write down exactly what they do as they read. So if they reread a line of text, we note that. If they read a word incorrectly, we note that. If they do certain um, phonetic processes, um, use different letter symbol uh, relationships to try and figure out a word, we write that down. So we're documenting their reading behaviors to try and figure out what they're doing so we can help them to do it better. So one of the things I think is really interesting about the work in neuroscience, and Mark will tell you more about that um, later today, is it allows us a peek inside the box. Now, right now, it's a small peek. We don't know everything that's going on in the mind, and we're only beginning to understand the significance of those things that we can document. So what I'm offering today is a cautious um, approach to some of the possibilities of what I think neuroscience is telling us at this point in time and how neuroscience might help us to better teach children. But we're still at the very beginning and there's a lot of caution in what I'm saying today um, because we don't have clear ideas and clear answers. So what I like about what I'm seeing in some of this work in neuroscience and what I'm going to share with you today are the places where what neuroscience sees and the behaviors of children are similar or that they're saying the same thing, or they're confirming each other. And to me, that's very, very powerful. When children are doing things and it relates to what we see going on inside the mind, um, that is very confirming that perhaps we're on the right track. Because my assumption is that the brain and the behaviors are related. OK. So here's some big ideas from neuroscience, some of the things that are out there that I've been reading and that I think may be useful as we think about um, teaching children. One is the idea that there's many areas of the brain that are involved in decoding text. It's not just, we haven't just found one spot in the brain where it all happens. It happens across the brain from many different areas. And here's a little quote for you. The more complex subprocesses in readers' meaning construction seem to tap areas that process word meaning, syntax, semantics, text and narrative structure, tone, prior knowledge, emotion, and more in a multi-directional fashion going back and forth between all these things, and with great variability among subjects and readings. So different people do it in different ways. It's not exactly the same from everyone. And it's different with different readings, different texts, different textual situations. So just let's look at some of the ideas that are in there. We've got syntax, which has to do with grammatical structures. We have semantics, which has to do with meaning-making resources and the ways people draw on different information in the mind to understand what they're reading. We have text and narrative structure, which has to do with the characteristics of different genres, how a nonfiction text is different than a narrative. And we have to do with tone, the idea of affect. What is the, the way this, what is this text doing to me? Is it very serious? Is it informational? Or is it something that draws me in um, emotionally? OK. So this is one of the big ideas I want to play with. The other is the idea that there's uh, a quantity and a quality of networks associated with words. And the more those are built together, it helps someone to comprehend. So it's not just knowing a definition for a word. It's the network of knowledge about that word that comes together to help us comprehend text and the networks between this word and the next word and the next word and the next word. So here we have an example like this. Read those two sentences. She read the book, she will read the book. How do we know that it's read in one sentence and read in the other, right? It's because we have a network of knowledge about that word and we know that when it's in one situation, it's gonna be said one way and it was in another situation, it's gonna be said another way. Read this sentence. How many of you had to stop and process on that word, right? 
Okay, because so it's setting you up for one way of knowing the sentence. If it's smelly and ugly to look like, it's probably a sewer. But when you get to the end of the sentence, you realize it's a sewer. Your brain had to do some different uh, back and forth there to get to the proper meaning of that sentence. And this is what I'm talking about when I say that there's these multiple systems in our minds. We call them cueing systems that people rely on. And this is what's fascinating me about recent work in neuroscience is that it's supporting this understanding that um, we've been starting to develop instructionally. Okay. So here's another big idea. Multiple ways of knowing words is also significant. The degree of word knowledge, specifically phonetical, orthographic, and semantic knowledge at the time of word learning, when you learned a word, did you learn it with all this complexity? Influences se se subsequent recognition of the word in new contexts. So again, it's this deep meaning of deep understandings of words, deep knowledge of words from multiple spaces and in multiple ways. So we have phonetical phonological knowledge, which has to do with the sound of the word. We have orth orthographic knowledge, which has to do with the spelling of the word and the way it looks. And we have semantic knowledge that has to do with the meaning of the word. And all three of those things come together. And skilled reading, according to neuroscience, requires orchestration. <coughs> Being able to bring all of these different ways of understanding words and ideas and texts together in order to be a fluent reader. So when we talk instructionally and when I work with teachers, we simplify it to a diagram that looks like this. We talk about meaning, what texts mean, understanding text, making sense of text. We talk about syntax, the grammatical structures, the ways words, when they sound right, the ways we talk, the ways nouns and verbs and adjectives and adverbs go together. And we talk about visual information, the letters and the sounds, what we call phonics and looking at words and just knowing that word or knowing a part of the word. All of those must come together in order to have that comprehension. So here's some definitions of each of these. But what I want to do is to play with these a little bit and have you work with these. Go ahead and read this aloud. Aloud, come on. <laughs> Okay, anyone notice anything funky in this passage? Okay, yes, go ahead. The boot, okay, it started out a boat and it turned into a boot. Okay, what else? Though the door. Though the door. How many of you did not catch that? You don't have to raise your hands, but just think in your head, okay? Often people don't catch that one. You know why? Because you're a good reader. If you weren't a good reader, you'd be stumbling over every single time something varied. But because you're constructing meaning and good readers construct meaning, they don't notice that, right? You say through the door because you know that's what it's supposed to be. So here we're getting an example of how meaning often overrides the visual information on the page. Is there anything else you caught? Yes? Should have planned ahead? Yeah. He says should have planned ahead. That's wrong. Okay, and how many of you read it the way it should have been? There's more. What else? That's how I read it. That's how you read it. <laughs> yes. Yep, we have a gender switch here, turn into a male by the end of the passage. Yes. Take the book apart. Uh huh, apart. It should not be two words, right? And there's one more. Did anyone find it? Almost no one finds this. I think I used this at least 10 times before I found the the, the. Okay? So your mind is constructing meaning, and the meaning is overriding the information that you actually have on that page. And that's because you're good readers. So one of the meanings, one of the sources of information we use is meaning. And meaning is, be, is, is being constructed in multiple areas of your brain, but they're orchestrating together to help you to read this text. And meaning has to do with the pictures, the graphs, the charts, your prior knowledge, your expectations for making sense. If you were a six-year-old, you'd be looking at the picture and using that to help you make meaning. But meaning, and, and meaning is also the most important thing in reading, at least I would argue. You very rarely pick up something to read it without planning to understand it, right? This is the reason we read. Here's another example for you. Read the top thing out loud, the orange part. Okay. 
So now we're going to talk about syntax, grammatical structures. I'm going to ask you some comprehension questions. You all understood this, right? Oh, yeah. yeah, it makes total sense. Okay. What squonked? <laughs> yes. How did it squonk? Where did it squonk thoroughly? Of course. And what kind of a think is it? Excellent. You understood everything you read. <laughs> right? So how did you answer those questions? None of you know what a woggly think is. I know you don't. So how did you get those questions right? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just really smart. You've learned the structures of language. So when it says the woggly think, you know that woggly is going to be an adjective, right? An adverb. An adjective? Ad yeah. yeah. But, but, and think is going to be the noun. And squonk obviously has to be a verb because it's in the past tense, right? And mirror the herb as a prepositional phrase, right? OK, so you knew all those things because you understand language. And if I ask you these literal low-level questions, you're going to be able to get them right. However, if I ask you these, OK, or an inference question on the bottom, like why did a squonk mirror the herb? If you don't know what squonking is or what a herp is, you would never know why anyone or anything would squonk me or a herp. Right? So here we've got you using syntax, the language structures, the grammar, and making it sound right to um, contribute to your comprehension. You don't totally understand it, but you can certainly answer some basic questions. So we have meaning. The idea that we're making meaning with text and our understandings of text and our construction of meaning will sometimes override what we actually see on the page. We have syntax, the idea that we have these language structures come from oral language that we can carry into our reading and use to contribute to our understanding of text. And now we have visual information. Go ahead and read this. There was once a fisherman and his wife who lived near the sea. You don't have all the letters, but you can still figure it out because you're good processors of visual information. OK. Keep reading. Each day, each day, well, Duh. <laughs> OK. okay. Now that one was a little harder than this one was, right? Yeah. And part of it is, is that we're much better at searching the front ends of words than the back ends of words. And when you teach kids to read, assuming that they don't have confusions on directionality, they tend to start with the front ends of words and then move towards processing the, the, the back ends of words. OK. And this proves it. Go ahead and read this. Easier, right? OK, because here you have the front ends. Helps out a lot. Now try this one. <laughs> I've never had anyone get all the way through it, but give it a go. <laughs> why is this one harder? Yeah, wife, wife. I caught a. Uh, it's just the vowels. Yeah, we need those consonants. And if you think about English, the vowels are notoriously inconsistent in the sounds they make, right? And they really depend on the letters around them to help you know how to pronounce them. OK? So vowels are notorious, and this is our example there. And here you have your consonants, so go ahead and read. Oh, there's, there should be foolish. There's some missing spaces there. Is come true. Okay. So here it's showing how you process visual information. What's that? Oh, sure. You foolish man, cried his wife, you should not have let it go. An enchanted fish can make wishes come true. Okay. Yeah. So here you get an example of how you process different uh, visual information differently. It's helpful, it's very useful. I'm not saying you don't teach phonics, but it is only one of the three queuing systems. And we don't, we don't necessarily need to process every single letter and every single word in order to be able to read text. 
And if you did, you'd be a very slow reader. So we have visual information. And one more consideration I want to bring to you is the idea that you have to have a sense of what you're going to read about. And when you give children a new story to read that they've never read before, one of the things you want to say to them is, this is something new. It's about this. These are the kind of things you'll see in it. Let's look at the pictures together. You want to give them a frame for what they're going to read. Because I'm going to have you read this. Go ahead and read it in your head if you want. <laughs> yeah, well, okay. So is, did anyone have any trouble decoding any of those words? No. Do you need any trouble um, with word meanings? Anything I need to explain to you what it means? Do you understand it? Some people do, but not everybody. Okay. wonder if I say this and then you go back and read it, it'll make perfect sense. Okay. So this is an example where I didn't give you the frame. I didn't let you know what you're reading about. There were no words in here like detergent or washing machine or laundry. None of those words were there to actually key you into what you're reading about. And that makes it very tricky to understand it. So we have, as I was saying before, we have meaning, we have syntax, we have visual information, but we also have to have a purpose and an understanding of what it is that we're reading and what we expect to get out of it. And all of those things are processes that are going on in different parts of per people's brains. And one of the things that I'm arguing for today is that in order to teach children, we need to be teaching for all three of these things and probably more. This is probably a simplified model to say there's just three. But we definitely need to help kids to put all of those things together. So we have our meaning, visual, syntax, and i got one little more exercise for you to go through. If blank across the grass, what could go in there? Slithered. Slithered. Rolled. 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 Sorry. Rolled. Crawled, ran, hopped, jumped. Right? OK. You're all using syntax. You all gave me verbs in the past tense. John let his pet rabbit go. It blank across the grass. Hopped. Scurried. Scampered. But that's it, right? We no longer have rolled. We no longer have slithered. Those rabbits don't do those things. So now you're using meaning. You're using your prior knowledge about rabbits. You've narrowed the field to what it could be. And then if I give you visual information, you know automatically that it's going to be hopped. So what you can see with this tiny example is how these three processes come together and help you to not only read this, but to be able to know you're right when you read this. Because you can use the different systems to cross check and to make sure that you're correct. So what do you do when a student gets stuck on a word when reading? The goal is to prompt the child to attend to aspects of the text that he's currently neglecting. And the goal is to get the child to draw on all available resources. And the goal is to help the child integrate information using all the relevant areas of his brain. And this is what we want to do. So I'm going to go through this next section pretty quickly because I can see we're running a little low on time. But I want to talk about prompting. And this is what we do with children when we're in an instructional setting. We say things to them to get them to do the things they're not doing. So in this example, I didn't have to. This is a child who's reading along. He reads, it is from his grandmother. Give it to him. Child says, give instead of take give it to him instead of take it to him. That actually maintains meaning. That's actually a high level processing. This child is using meaning even though he got the wrong answer. And that SC tells us something even better, is that he self-corrected it. So he said give for take, and then he self-corrected it. So this is actually a high quality error, or a high quality miscue. So this is a nice example. This is a less nice example. This child says, Peep, 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 Brody Hen said, little chick, what is that soft nest? And if you look at the picture, you can see why he's talking about a soft nest. For this example, we've got to get the child to go back up 
and attend to the peep, peep, peep and say, okay, you're right, this could be a soft nest, but peep, peep, peep is what they're listening to. And the other thing that's tricky here is I might have to tell him the word scary because peep, peep, peep is generally not a scary word or scary thing, right? It's not a scary sound. So there's a confusing concept going on here. So if this child's reading this and says soft nest, I might say, that first word is scary and give that to him. And then I might have him go up and say, peep, peep, peep. What is that? What is, what's making that noise? Oh, what's the ch little chick asking about? What is that scary? Do you see a part of that word you know? Oh, you know no. No scary noise. Okay? So you can see what we're trying to do is to get that child to think about the story, use that meaning, but then also use the visual cues when they can. Let me show you another example. In this example, the child read, do you want a story about a little red hen, I asked. He book, he book instead of shook. What's he looking at? The okay, right? Okay, so he's looking at the, he's not looking at that beginning of the word. Okay. And in this example, the child self-corrected it. But if he hadn't self-corrected, I would say, look at the picture. Okay, and there is a book in it. You're right. But he book his head doesn't make sense. Go back and read it again and think what would make sense. So what we're trying to do is get the child at point of error when he's not making sense to make sense. So we ask him, what would make sense? Look at the picture again and read the sentence. What do you already know that might help you? Okay. Prompting for syntax. I've got one example for you. This is trying to get the child to think what would sound right. This child read, he stopped to swim instead of he stopped to swim. I might say, read that again and say what would sound like a book. What would it sound like in a book? Because this might be part of his oral language that he uses at home. This might be something he's very likely to say, but we want him to sound like a book. Just to get you to one more example, so that's syntax. Visual information. Here's an example. Now look at this picture. Does this dinosaur look like she's making a nest if you were six years old? Maybe not, right? So this child reads, were dinosaurs good eaters? Okay, because it looks like he's eating this grass. I would say, go back and read that again and check the first letter. Go back, read that again, and see, if there, and, and see if you can find the tricky part and see if you know that word. Okay? So here I'm trying to get the child to attend to the visual information. Do you see a part of the word you know? Do you know a word that looks like? Say the first part of the word, say more. Now I'm going to move real quickly to the end. Um, an additional concern is sometimes you come across words that just aren't in the child's speaking vocabulary. You've got to tell him the word salamander. Don't have him try and spend two hours trying to sound it out. If he doesn't know what a salamander is, we need to have that little vocabulary lesson there. That happens sometimes. So we have meaning, syntax, and visual. And what we want to do is to get kids to work at the intersection of these different points. And we also want the child to work at the center. So they want to be reading and be thinking about what would look right and make sense and sound like a book. And those are bringing together all those different neural networks and what's going on. So we've only scratched the surface. There's more than three sources of information. Here, this quote is talking about sociocultural aspects and how a child has grown up in a particular community, in a particular culture, in a particular household. And there's particular ways of seeing the world and understanding the world and valuing things in the world. And that all of those things have to do with how a child makes sense of text and that those contextual factors are also something that neuroscientists are starting to think about. Okay. So orchestration, um, and I'll leave you with one quote, quote, literacy educators are creating the context in which children's brains develop, enabling them to perform increasingly demanding reading tasks and develop capacities for comprehension, understanding, and lifelong learning across many situations and domains. And I argue that what we're trying to do when we teach kids to read is help them to use all the resources that they have and all the different um, mechanisms that are going on to solve words as they read. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. I'd like you to hold your questions until the end. Mark will come next, and then we'll have about 15 to 20 minutes for questions at the end. Um, well, thank you. It, it's um, very nice to be here, and that was a really great talk that Catherine gave. Um, so my name is Mark Seidenberg, and I'm, I'm a professor in the psychology department. 
uh, here at, at UW-Madison. Um, and as a researcher, I've been studying reading and how children learn to read for over 30 years. Uh, I've mainly studied children's behavior in schools and in laboratory settings. Uh, and since coming to UW in 2001, I've also been conducting studies of the brain bases of reading and language uh, using neuroimaging techniques. So I am one of those uh, cognitive neuroscientists who is conducting research that's relevant to reading. Uh, as an educator, I've taught courses on reading and dyslexia to several thousand college students. I also work with several organizations of parents of children with reading and language di disabilities. I'm very glad to be here, and I hope that uh, the events this week will be the start of a continuing dialogue about neuroscience and education, because there's a lot to discuss. Um, like everyone else in this room, I'm very concerned about America's literacy problem. A couple of years ago, we had a Sputnik moment. You probably recall it, although it went by very quickly. It was occasioned by the release of results from the 2009 PISA exercise which is a large cross-national study of comparison of reading, math, and science achievement among 15-year-olds. Uh, the US, again, scored significantly beha behind countries like Korea, Finland, Canada, and Japan, as we have since testing in this program began in 2000. What was different this time was that it, the sample assessment happened to include students from Shanghai who scored highest on all three subjects. The emergence of the illiteracy problem is visible in the performance of fourth and eighth grade readers on the NAEP, the nation's report card. It's a standardized test administered by the US Department of Education. Around two thirds of the kids, 60% or so, of the children have scored on, at the basic or below basic level since testing in this program started in 1992. So that, that's basic and below basic. And these scores are not changing a great deal over time. Uh, then there's another uh, 2012 report about adult literacy. Uh, it was issued by the National Research Council. Uh, I'm one of the co-authors of this report, uh, one of many. Uh, and we estimated that there are over 90 million adults who have only rudimentary reading skills. Uh, you know, at the level, at these levels, a person might be able to find, follow the instructions on a box of pancake mix, but maybe not the information that comes with their statin drug. As a reading researcher, this information plagues me. For one thing, the situation isn't new. Scores on standardized tests of reading have been flat for years. There's a suspicion heard everywhere from the Ivy League colleges to your local middle school that other reading skills, important ones that are perhaps less easily measured, are in active decline. Anxiety about reading treat achievement underlies endless debates about how reading should be taught. Parents are frustrated. They know that it is essential that their children learn to read and remain engaged in reading, but find this goal increasingly elusive. What we as scientists know about reading has grown enormously, but as ever, many people cannot read or read poorly or are able to read but avoid it. And so I've asked myself whether our science has anything to contribute to improving literacy outcomes in this country and elsewhere. Could neuroscience be the savior of American education? Here's the answer as I see it. Yes, no, and maybe. The yes is this. It's true that we're making considerable progress in understanding the brain bases of reading, language, learning, memory, attention, motivation, and other topics that are obviously relevant to education. In the case of reading, what we've learned already has important implications for educational practice. Thus, I'm enormously optimistic about the potential for linking brain science and education. The no part is like this. In most areas, the reading is still in the early stages. The research, the research is still in the early stages. We know some things, we know, don't know others. We need to know, know much more and that's going to take time. Moreover, translating research findings into educational practices is extremely difficult as everyone in, in this room knows very well. It's easy to come up with very exciting implications of this research for education. It's another thing to devise actual programs and curricula and then conduct the appropriate studies to gain empirical evidence about their effectiveness. 
We're nowhere near the point where anyone could, would be justified in developing a neuroscience-based education program. I say this even though I am no, aware that there are some very unlucky children uh, enrolled in schools in the US and Canada uh, uh, where such ill-conceived programs are already in place, which I could talk about in the discussion period if people are interested. The maybe part is this. Bringing neuroscience to bear on education will require conducting business differently than we have in the past. The cultures of science and education are quite different in this country and have been for many years. We think about how children learn and develop in different ways. We value different kinds of evidence. There's an urgent need to bridge the gaps between us. And at events like this one and the others this week are a great start. But more than that, there's a need for a new kind of program that doesn't exist anywhere in this country. One in which science and education are fully integrated and routinely influence each other. I want to lay my cards on the table here. I don't think educators will be able to use the science appropriately or effectively unless they understand it at a deep level. People don't have to do the science themselves, but they have to know enough about it to understand what is and is not known to approach it with the critical thinking skills we try to develop in our students. That means integrating the science into the training of educational professionals, teachers, principals, school superintendents, policy makers, curriculum developers. That's something that isn't done right now. Of course, the opposite is true too. We need better, it's a bridge that goes in both directions and we need more contact and more communication from people on the education side informing what's happening on the cognitive neuroscience side. Whereas I'm confident about how the science is developing, I'm less confident that we can build this new kind of enterprise. There are a lot of obstacles to overcome. I think for many people on the education side, and Catherine would be a great example, the spirit is certainly willing. People see the value in the research or its potential. But the institu institutional structures are weak. And so fundamental institutional changes might be needed but are hard to achieve. So while I want to be positive here today, because I, I really do believe in the relevance and potential of this kind of science for education, I also want to be realistic and cautious and alert you to both the opportunities and potential hazards ahead. Let me tell you a true story. I've been doing some volunteer work with a woman who has a dyslexic child. Dyslexia is a developmental condition that interferes with a child's ability to learn to read. It has genetic and neurobiological bases. In this child's family, there's a history of reading impairment. Many fam family members have struggled with reading, including the mother, who's an MD. The child's had a neuropsychological workup. It's clear there's a reading impairment. He attends good schools. The parents are deeply involved. The child is working hard and struggling just terribly. He's a classic dyslexic. The mother goes in to talk it over with the child's teacher. My son is really having trouble reading, she says. The teacher says, I know. Did you read books to him when he was little? Do you have enough books in the home? Do you think he's just not interested in reading? I've heard this story in different forms from many people in many parts of the country. You have to imagine how disheartening this is for the parent to be asked, have you tried hard enough at home? Other times a teacher will say, oh, well, he'll just outgrow it. Well, sometimes, but probably not. It's a developmental disorder. The child could be helped, but he won't grow out of it like a pair of sneakers. So the first, if if the first question is, does neuroscience have anything to contribute to education, then the answer is yes. It's important to distinguish whether this child's reading problem arises from inadequate experience or a neurodevelopmental disorder. Knowing that will change how that pro child's problem can be approached. Let me be clear here that I'm not blaming the teacher here. She responded with what she knew. If children are provided with a literacy-rich environment, they'll learn to read. She didn't know about dyslexia because it wasn't part of her training. What she might have heard about it probably didn't extend further than what she would have read in the mass media or on the internet, which is that, you know, it's a visual disorder and the kids read letters background, which isn't true. 
Then, being told the child is diagnosed as dyslexic, there's very little she could do with this information. There are ways to help many dyslexics. In control tests, the best programs are effective with about 60 to 70 percent of the children if there's an appropriate level of intervention at an early enough age. The science isn't advanced enough to reach everyone. There's still about those 30 or 35 percent of the children are non-responders. We think these children are probably um, uh, kids who have other comorbid conditions like ADD or, or a speech language disorder. And research is, you know, continuing to try to find out more about these kids. The point is that we know a great deal about dyslexia, and yet very little of this research has penetrated educational practice. In fact, on the education side, people are still debating if dyslexia exists. So this was a paper that was a cover article in Science by John Gabri Gabrielli, which reviewed evidence about the brain bases of dys dyslexia. And within the same year, there was this article in the Journal of the Philosophy of Education, in which uh, educators, uh, the authors, reviewed this literature and called into question whether the condition exists. And if it did exist, whether their practices would have need to change in any way. So this is the kind of gap between science and education that I'm talking about. Why does it exist? Probably for many reasons, but here's one. Reading the literature, going to conferences, talking to people, leaves the impression that many folks on the education side are deeply skeptical about scientific studies of educational issues, like how children learn to read and what goes wrong when there's a problem and what to do about it. I think it's fair to say there's a pretty widely shared feeling that no controlled laboratory study could capture the complexity of what happens in real classrooms. What the child learns, how they progress, is determined by many more factors than we can possibly study given the constrictions of the scientific method. As a result, these folks have more confidence in their own direct experience. They're the ones on the front lines in the schools. They're the ones interacting with hundreds or thousands of children. They see what works and what doesn't. That's plenty of, a, of evidence. Well, I have some sympathy for this concern. It is definitely difficult to conduct experiments that deal with complex, good experiments that deal with complex phenomena. There certainly are education-related studies that are well designed by scientific studies that tell us very little of interest. If you habitually study something complex by decomposing it into its parts, you might be at risk of losing track of the larger phenomenon. The studies could inadvertently exclude factors that are actually highly relevant. And here's the thing. In some cases, this concern is valid, and in some cases, it's not. For some kinds of questions, the divide and conquer methodology is very effective. There are entire sciences that have done quite well with it. Yes, it's hard to do studies in classroom studies, but people do it. And the possibilities are always changing. You've all heard about big data, the analyses of humongous data sets that are afforded by modern computer technologies. Um, we now have tools that allow people to record everything that a child says or hears during the course of the day. This is one particular system called Lena, and this child is about to wear it in her overalls. Um, so uh, you can record everything the child says or hears in the course of a day for many days. Kid wears it around the neck or in a pocket, yields vast amounts of data, and affords the possibility of rigorously studying com the complex conditions under which children learn. This research is not easy, but what's the alternative? Is personal experience a reliable guide? Not so much. People are notoriously unreliable observers of events. We are all subject to a variety of biases in how we perceive information in a way evidence. The psychologist Daniel Kahneman won a Nobel Prize for showing this. What we look at depends on what we expect. Some of the demonstrations that Catherine did showed that. What we expect depends on what we've been taught. And that teacher I told you about before, she hadn't been taught about dyslexia. So to summarize, yes, there's the danger that scientific studies can oversimplify a phenomenon. But no, studies aren't irrelevant just because they were carefully designed and carried out in the laboratory. Okay, let's get back to neuroscience. 
there's a bit of a paradox here. Many educators have been skeptical about behavioral studies of reading and dyslexia. So the thinking is, let's look at the brain. Fine, brain research is quite exciting. But here's the thing. When I have my cognitive neuroscientist hat on, I'm doing the same kinds of studies as when I have my experimental psychologist hat on. We're not scanning classrooms of children. In fact, the neuroimaging research that we share an interest in here consists of behavioral experiments that happen to be done in a scanner. It's the same kind of study reading researchers have been doing for years, except that now we can look at the brain at the same time. So for the people who are skeptical about the relevance of behavioral studies, behavioral laboratories that research for education, and I'm not necessarily thinking of anyone in particular in this room, but sort of broader, broader tendencies, uh, you know, the question I have to ask is, what, what is it that changes just because we now also have brain data? What makes neuroscience different if the methods are subject to the same concerns as before? Well, um, here's one possible explanation for this paradox, and um, it's what I would call neurophilia. I, I made up this word. I don't know if it's, <laughs> it's grammatical. So people are, are neurophiles. It's like being a francophile, but more brain and less fromage. Uh, people are deeply fascinated by the brain. And the fact that we now have technologies that allow us to look at what the brain does while people are thinking or reading or looking at faces is truly astonishing. Uh, you know, this is a beautiful picture, but it's also uh, representing data about uh, fiber tracks in the brain, connectivity between different regions that are supporting the kind of processing that uh, Catherine was talking about. Uh, these tools are pretty astounding. Um, we can see a living human brain at work, something that we couldn't do until very recently. Um, and I, I think these, this, this amazing methodological development is feeding into something uh, something else, which is a very general sort of human tendency to think that there's something really special and privileged, something more satisfying about understanding behavior at a neural level. Psychologists have been studying reading since the 19th century. We've even accumulated a vast body of knowledge. We summarized some of this in this uh, long paper. Um, uh, the same is true about many other phenomena like decision-making and emotions and how memory works. With this, these new technologies, some people want to skip the behavioral research and go straight to the brain. You hear this a lot at neuroimaging conferences. Forget about those psychological theories. We just need to understand how the brain works. Perhaps you've heard of the following study. Some studies, psychologists at Yale did an experiment in which they made up a nonsensical study, a study with data that made no sense whatsoever. They wrote it up as if it was a real experiment. And then they asked students to read it and answer some questions about it. If the paper was accompanied by a picture of brain activity, equally contrived and nonsensical, subjects rated it as more believable than if the data were presented in a table. That's neurophilia. There's been quite a backlash against this kind of attitude in, our, in the scientific community. People realize that being able to associate brain activity with behavior may help us understand the brain better, but doesn't necessarily add that much to what we understand about the behavior. Indeed, one of the things we might talk about in discussion time is all those things that, that Catherine knows about reading, she knew before there was any neuroscience at all. And in fact, the neuroscience didn't really do, it, it might, have, might corroborate what, what she's finding, but um, at least the, the research that she was pointing to doesn't really, um, her, her findings and her understanding predates that uh, uh, neuroscience completely. Uh, I have to say, it's encouraging to me that we're studying many of the same things. Uh, lexical ambiguity res resolution was the subject of my thesis, which was in 1980, and those sentence structure ambiguities, uh, uh, that uh, am syntactic ambiguities that Catherine showed, uh, you know, the, one of the world experts on the study of syntactic ambiguity resolution is Mary Ellen McDonald, who is a, who is a professor in our department. Um, also, you know, uh, uh, we like a lot of the same phenomena. So uh, does anybody see what's happening in this one? 
it's back a few years ago when the Capital Times was still a newspaper. Find the mistake, find the problem. Anybody got it? If you've seen it before, it's not fair. Yes. There's two ases. It's the the, the experiment, but as as. Actually, this is an extremely interesting one because what they were trying to say is the as, as the, the the repetitions well understood. This isn't just that the person repeated as. What they were trying to write was as ag secretary. And so the phonological overlap there contributed to the error. I had some email with the people and they were very abashed by this. And I said, oh no, this is a very well studied phenomenon. It's great. Uh, okay, so we, we study a lot of the same things. Of course, we've made a lot of progress. Uh, and uh, there may be more out there in, the, in, in our world than you're aware of on these topics. Um, okay, so this, there, this is an important question. Anybody who's interested in neuroscience and education has to ask, what are the neuroscientists doing for me? What am I learning that I didn't learn by, from other means? I believe there's plenty of room for the neuroscience to make contributions, but you always have to be asking that question. You know, the reason being, uh, 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 we're primarily interested in children's behavior, right? We want to know if they're achieving or not. We now want to know if they can read and they can comprehend what they, what they read and whether they can write a grammatical sentence, among other things. Uh, you know, how can I, as a teacher, promote learning uh, as measured by people's behavioral performance? Uh, I think the neuroscience can contribute to a deeper understanding of such behaviors. For example, uh, by helping to distinguish between uh, behaviors that are very similar but actually arise from different causes. So I haven't talked very much about my own research here, or other re the research of other people in this area, because uh, I wanted to make some of these broader points. But indeed, there are ways in which we can see how the neuroscience will uh, be able to reveal things that are not visible just from um, observation of uh, overt behavior. Uh, but it, you know, this kind of work and, and, and going forward uh, takes more than just a brain snap. Uh, you know, correlating, uh, 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 showing that there's some brain activity that's associated with some behavioral phenomenon um, doesn't really um, uh, um, ha uh, pr help things progress very much. There has to be a theory and data that link brain behavior to particular kinds of be behavioral outcomes. Uh, at, at this point, way too much neuroimaging research is of a correlational nature. This brain state is correlated with this behavior. The distinguished British, neuros, devel, uh, British developmental cognitive neuroscientist Dorothy Bishop, who herself has conducted neuroimaging studies, has been collecting findings of this sort and how they're described in the, in the news media. This is from her blog, which I encourage everyone to immediately uh, get into, but you know, these are all links to studies about future angst. Brain scans show uncertainty fuels anxiety. Brain scans show how multitasking is harder for seniors. Brain scans show how teens are more me first than adults. Brain scans, brain scans, they show this, they show that. Look, you know, again, one has to ask, what are the brain scans adding to the understanding of the phenomena? If the, if the finding is just of the sort, well, it's confirming things that we already knew, that's not enough. Because, you know, th the goal isn't just to kind of go through the research and find findings that are encouraging because they, they, tell, they, they confirm things we already know. You can't sort of cherry pick the findings to, to, to uh, see which ones are, are uh, consistent with your existing beliefs. Um, uh, the, um, uh, yeah. Um, so um, to summarize, yes, the brain data are important, but it's not just about pretty pictures. Uh, and it's behavioral outcomes that we're ultimately concerned about as educators. OK. So I've suggested that neuroscience is potentially of great relevance to education, but I've also tried to emphasize the current state of the art and some things to watch out for. My main point is that the endeavor can't succeed unless educators become more knowledgeable about our research. You have to be able to read the studies with the relevant background knowledge and a good critical eye. Um, right. Um, one, one, I might say that you know, there could be more friendliness towards this kind of um, 
research in general. I, I think sometimes people you know, can teach science in their classroom, but then think that science doesn't actually apply to their own, own behavior. And, and that's something that, that we, we need to get past. All right, I want to close by raising some other concerns. Again, I'm an insider. I do this kind of research. I haven't spent my time trying to show you all the great studies that people have done, although I'm happy to discuss them. Um, I'm trying to, you know, I have a good sense of what the strengths and limitations of the approach are, and I'm trying to, trying to share. Um, right now, my main concern is about the potential for misusing the science. Uh, if you don't understand the science well because it wasn't part of your training, uh, you can't independently evaluate it, and that makes you vulnerable to all sorts of chicanery. Uh, there are plenty of people who are already saying, brain, science, education, now. People can see that the science could be relevant, and they know there's a need, given the literacy data and all, but they can't critically assess the research themselves, and so there's a gap. And into this gap, many are quite willing to leap. I'm not referring to educators here. I'm talking about entrepreneurs products, brain training software. So there's a lot of brain training software out there. Neuroactive brain training software for Windows and Macintosh. <laughs> um, um, brain builder, some more software. Brain trainer, more software. Uh, there's this one that improves many types of memory. It's fun and easy to use trains 18 brain functions throughout the entire brain. Um, so there's a vast market for this kind of product. And you know, here's the deal. I mean, first of all, they could work. You'd have to know, do the research to find out, but I mean, they could work. And then there's a psychology behind this kind of thing, which is, well, what if they do work? I don't want to miss the boat. Is it worth my 100 bucks to actually try this thing out? Eventually, there are people, intrepid people, because there isn't a lot of reward for doing this kind of research, who conduct independent assessments of the effectiveness of these kind of programs. This kind of stuff should make educators mad, right? Here are folks who are going out, selling programs that will, you know, teach your kid everything they're not learning in school, eh? And, um, uh, and making grand claims and uh, profits from it. Um, there is eventually, you know, a research, uh, a body of research will eventually build up around these things. And some people actually, you know, try to do independent tests of whether they're effective or not. Um, here's one. So um, uh, Charles Hume and a colleague whose name I'm not, I can't pronounce correctly, uh, did uh, a, a recent, uh, published a recent meta-analysis meta of brain training software that is uh, specifically focused at working memory, a very important component of the cognitive system. And, you know, they treat it like scientists and they go through what the software does and what the findings are and what the uh, claims are and what the independent evaluations show. And basically, it's, it's, it's pretty much what you expect. It's the evidence that these things work is really um, not, not there. Um, uh, here's one more that I just happen to really uh, like. I'm going to try to finish up quickly, uh, but I just really want to share these with you. This is for another science uh, bit uh, 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 software, and they got this brain thing here with the people skills and the brain speed and attention and so on. You know, blowing up this little image they have here is this is just an incredible, incredible picture. This is about as useful as this. <laughs> um, I'll skip over this because there isn't time, but I, I'm, I'm, I'd be happy that he asked about it. There's a particular program for teaching reading called Fast Forward. It's been highly controversial. Uh, it seems to be supported by neuroscience, cognitive neuroscience um, evidence. This is a paper that was published a couple of years ago in Proceedings of the National Con Academy of Sciences, a very prestigious journal, which had before and after pictures of uh, uh, just children with dyslexia before they underwent the program. Com this is a commercial program, and then after, and you know, you can see things changed. Um, so, um, again, however, there are people who are arm's distance from the research, who aren't involved in the company, who aren't actually uh, selling the product, who get around to uh, doing the independent sort of assessments. Uh, again, I'd point you to uh, Dorothy Bishop's blog. Uh, in which she really called out this particular study for um, just being um, uh, 
indicative of a very bad problem at that journal and uh, in, uh, with respect to uh, how, ne how, how neuroimaging research is being uh, evaluated. Okay. So um, uh, there, is a number of, there are a number of studies you, you, I'm sure you're beginning to encounter in which people do before and after brain imaging pictures. Uh, like this one here. These studies are difficult to do. Dorothy's done the, the review of that. Those studies, they, they, they have issues like, uh, it's not just early days here. This research has not been done properly yet. You know, there are issues about what, whether you have a control group, that kind of, kind of level of things. Um, okay, so let me try to summarize. Uh, Neuroscience research, cognitive neuroscience in particular, is going to continue to progress. And, and we are going to learn more and more about topics of educational relevance. Uh, it, it therefore seems that neuroscience should eventually link up with education. Uh, people can take steps to try to promote development in that direction now. Uh, you can read Dan Willingham's column that he publishes in the uh, publication American Educator, which is put out by the American Federation of Teachers in which a cognitive scientist discusses the literature and the kinds of questions we've been talking about today uh, in, a, in a way that's accessible to, to many people. Um, uh, what I'm trying to suggest is that just tacking some neuroscience onto existing educational program is, programs is probably not the most fruitful way to proceed. Uh, I think we need a new kind of program or department or institute or a college of education uh, in which neuroscience and psychology and educated education are integrated in a serious way. And what that means is training the next generation of teachers and researchers and educators in a different way than we do now. Uh, there is no program like this anywhere as yet. Uh, it is something that we could do here at U UW. You know, we're in the Wisconsin idea room and it seems to me there is a Wisconsin idea here. We have the resources on this campus. Researchers, faculty, educators, students to build upon. Um, I think we need to go beyond where we're at now, though, to create new kinds of structures and new ways of integrating these different approaches. Uh, it, it takes leadership and vision. Uh, it would require better cooperation across the aisle. But you know, we could lead the way, and I hope we do. Thank you. Are there any questions? Everybody knows everything. <laughs> so I have a question for Mark, um, possibly more of a comment than a question. You can decide if there's a question here. Uh, the example of the teacher who wasn't aware that there might be biological or developmental reasons that a child might struggle with reading is shocking. And I gather from your example that this is not uncommon. Um, and so clearly, there's a role for a teacher education to play in something like that. Um, but you describe this as a matter of institutional need for institutional change. And I'm sure that's part of it. But part of it also, I think, is that there are real resource constraints in changing teacher education. I have two constraints in mind. One is just the amount of time we want our teachers to be in their training programs. Uh, we're trying to reduce the requirements on emerging teachers because we try to, currently, we try to load up too much on them. So this is a new set of things that they have to learn. Indeed. And the second constraint is on who goes into teaching. Yeah. So many people who go into teaching are not that enthusiastic about biology. Yeah. Otherwise, they would be biologists. So those seem to me two barriers that are not institutional structures, but that have to do with real resource constraints on teacher preparation, and I wonder how we respond to that. Um, I, I think that is a, I'm aware of that, those issues. 
I talked to someone from Michigan who said, you know, if we introduced this stuff into our program, uh, students wouldn't, wouldn't come here. They would go elsewhere because it would be easier to get their degrees. Look, I can't plan the curriculum and tell you. I, I'm, I'm doing the, the science. I don't know how to organize the programs. I don't even understand how, how the current programs work in detail. But if you think that neuroscience is relevant to education, and we want to use it in intelligent ways and not be subject to all the chicanery, then what's the alternative? And how you do that uh, such that, um, I don't know how you do that. The other question is, you know, there's a kind of chicken egg thing about who goes into the field. I mean, everyone wants to increase, you know, attract more, uh, the best people we can into teaching and indeed attract you know, do uh, you know? Follow the Finnish model and have uh, have it have have very very highly skilled people going into the field. Um, uh, how do you do that? Possibly by um, I can't. I don't know how you do that. That's the issue. And so, perhaps indeed, um, uh, this is where I imagine a cutting edge program, right? One where indeed you actively recruit people who come from um, these others are better prepared in these other areas or have the interests. And, and you try to do it differently and set up a sort of model that other people might want to um, uh, uh, implement. Uh, I, I recognize there are many real world uh, issues here. I don't see what the alternative is because otherwise people are just going to be um, at the mercy of folks who will tell them a story. Can I, can I comment on this? I know I'm the, not, the, not part of the presentation, but I do want to say something about the quality of the students who go into teacher education. Here at UW-Madison, they are as competitive as, the, as their peers in the sciences um, and in a lot of the other disciplines. If you look at our GPAs and you look at the courses that our students have taken, they're extremely intelligent, extremely talented individuals. Um, I do think we've got systems issues that we have to deal with. Indeed, we do not want to assume that the students can't handle it. There's an, we haven't even tried to teach it. I te have taught a course on reading and dyslexia for 10 years in this department. There have been hundreds of students in this class. Why isn't it cross-listed? You know? I mean, why, why isn't there more traffic back and forth? We don't know about it. <laughs> <laughs> so so there's, there's a, there's a, there, these are issues that can be dealt with. But um, I, I totally agree. I, Yes, we want the best possible to encourage talented people to go into education. However, even more. But um, I wouldn't want to underestimate the people's abilities to understand this materials. And using the teaching uh, method, uh, tools that are available to us, there's online and otherwise, uh, a lot of people want to know about the brain for crying out loud. So, so I don't actually think the, the time issue is different. But you know, integrating it into the program, seems more realistic. Thank you. Hi. Um, I just wanted to comment sort of directly on this, um, partly because I have a, sort of a unique view, I guess, on it. Um, I'm a graduate student in the Neuroscience and Public Policy program. It's a joint degree program that offers a neuroscience PhD and a master's in public affairs from the Little Follett School. Um, and while I'm not an education specialist by any means, I'm interested in this topic because I think that it's an area where neuroscience does have the ability to inform uh, the way that public services are delivered. Um, and I, I guess um, my uh, comments slash question um, pertains to the institutional issues that we're talking about. Um, the program is pretty young. There aren't that many of us in it, but it does try to appeal specifically to a group of people who are interested not just in one subject or the other, but in the intersection of the two. And it does speak to the idea that there, there could be um, an untapped group of individuals who want to study at the intersection, and that could you know, be a real um, catalyst for breaking down those barriers. Instead of assuming you know, we have the neuroscience people and the education people, and later in their careers they realize that there are these um, kind of you know, interstitial ways of, of bringing those together, saying are there people now who are interested, and the only way to, to find that out, I think, is to uh, you know, try to establish a program like that, and that's sort of how our model has been working. But on the flip side, there is um, a structural problem in that 
there aren't really many sources of funding that are willing to uh, go out on a limb um, in support of cross-disciplinary programs at the graduate level. There are lots of um, initiatives in you know, research collaboration, but not so much in terms of actually educating people. And I guess my question is whether you are aware of um, efforts at a higher order institutional level like the NSF or AAAS to initiate you know, uh, programs that not only address those connections, but try to educate people at the intersection. Um, I, I want to say one thing, and then Ed's going to answer. Ed, Ed gets the question. Uh, the, the one thing is I was trying to say that, you know, these are the resources we have on campus already that are provide the basis for, you know, we talk about interdisciplinary, but I, I mean it. You know, it's, it's uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, and so I didn't, I'm aware of the program that you're in, and it is part of the, this, this picture. Now it's going to answer the question. Um, so at, at the risk of being accused of tooting my own horn, um, this is happening right here, right now. So um, through a Madison, Madison Initiative for Undergrads, MIU proposal, there is a new education and educational services undergraduate certificate program that just received approval. And I'm one of two new faculty hires here off this MIU program. And in particular, I'm teaching a class um, an undergraduate class right now that's listed as a 506, Ed Psych 506, that is Minds, Brains, and Education, that is intentionally bringing together what we know on the education side about skills, attention, reading, math and number, these sorts of things, what we know on the neuroscience side, the difficulties of trying to bring together these different research traditions, these different groups of people, these different bodies of findings, and trying to target a group of people who may end up going into education and education services type fields. Um, so that's one way to do it, is to think about it as a cross-cutting methodological thing of how do we bring together all these different fields I'm also co-teaching a class this semester on what's called the number sense. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about this on Wednesday. But what do we know about some of the basic cognitive and biological primitives that give rise to math and number abilities? Where have we made good progress in linking up neuroscience and education in the math and number domain? Where do we have a lot more things that we're going to struggle with? For example, trying to understand things like algebra. So exactly the same sorts of difficulties that Kathy and Mark are talking about in reading. We have some pretty good purchase from neuroscience on some of the basic things. We have less good purchase on some of the more complex things, some of the social factors, these sorts of things. Um, but we are building a science around this at multiple different levels. And that's happening here through actually bottom-up processes where undergraduates agreed to a fee increase. That led to this competitive process of proposing these different ideas. And here at Madison, we actually have something like that now being created. So um, that's, that's the best answer I can give you, is that it's happening here based on what's already in, in place. Um, I'd just like to invite Kathy um, and Cheryl, as teacher educators, to comment a bit on the kind of program that Mark is um, laying on the table here. Um, if I may, uh, I'd like to just add a personal comment. Uh, like Adam, I found your example of the teacher who seems to be uh, unaware that a, developmental, a specific kind of developmental disability might uh, be involved in that child's uh, reading difficulty. Uh, I found that uh, astounding, and you're, you're telling me it's not uncommon. Um, I think a teacher who is that unaware, and I should say his or her um, team, I mean, it's after all not just one person who creates that educational environment, is committing educational malpractice. And I'm, I'm sensitive to this partly because I committed the same malpractice myself uh, once upon a time. My, my only excuse is that it was 1962. And we... You did basic research in the area that... I know. Uh, launched it, a thousand ships. Well, I was, I, was at a, um, I was at an institution in Cambridge that didn't take a teacher preparation very seriously. Yeah. Um, anyway, I'd just like to invite um, Kathy and Cheryl to comment on, from your perspective as teacher educator. Yeah, as a 
a teacher educator, I guess I'm, I, I don't see the scenario that Mark described as often as I see the opposite. What I worry more about are teachers who, as soon as there's a problem with a child, it's a special education referral, and it's immediately, you know, there's something wrong with this kid and the overrepresentation of children of color and culturally diverse students in special education. And I think one of the things that's going on in schools right now to try and counteract that is the idea of response to intervention which is a theory that, that identifies kids who are struggling and then tries to provide them with really good educational experiences to differentiate between the children, which I think are very real, that Mark is um, describing, who do have some sort of um, physiological difficulty in processing reading or, or other um, cognitive activities. Um, but I, I guess what I'm, I'm more what I worry about more and what I see more often is teachers just sending the kid for the special ed referral before that child has had a chance to have really good instruction. So I think both of them, though, point to the same problem, which I think Mark is describing, and that is do teachers have a clear understanding of what constitutes a problem and then what are the responses that we should make to that? And the one piece that I want to bring into that is that we know what good instruction looks like. I think we have some really good ideas, the kinds of things I was talking about, teacher knowledge to be able to help kids to access multiple forms of information when they're stuck in reading. I think we've known that for a long, long time. But I don't think we have a lot of teachers on the ground that are skilled to be able to do this kind of um, on the ground analysis of kids, you know, what the child's not attending to in text and prompting them to do the right thing and creating instructional models that allow kids to be in situations where they're getting the kind of support on a long term basis that's going to make a difference for them. And I think it comes down to money. So I think part of it, yes, is teacher education, and we need to build in more knowledgeable reading teachers in addition to people who understand reading difficulties in our coursework. But I think we also need to have systems that support teacher knowledge and not the de-skilling of teachers and the scripted curriculum and um, the standards-based kinds of models that are taking away um, teacher uh, expertise. So I worry about that as well. And I would echo what Kathy says, with the exception that I think that one of the things that we have not done very well in teacher education is to teach teachers how to truly assess kids and then to think about how that, what they learn from that assessment matches the curricula that they have in mind or the instructional approaches that they have in mind. As a special educator, that is what was what my role was, was to identify those things and to match. And I think we could do a better job with general educators. I do want to say, though, that I am one of those parents who experienced this kind of a teacher with one of my children. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Could I comment a little bit on that? Uh, these are real issues, obviously. Um, one of the things is that, in Wisconsin at least, uh, there isn't much other than the classroom and special ed, because we don't have programs in place to deal with children who have other kinds of developmental disorders, like learning and reading disorders. And so that teacher is sending the kid to special ed. And the issue about minorities being overrepresented is absolutely true. Uh, a couple of researchers in Georgia, I, we, we just got a very nice grant from NIH to look at this exact issue. Why are African American children overrepresented in special ed? Um, so part of it is the state and the country where you know, we don't have, hey, dyslexia is not officially recognized by the state of Wisconsin as a condition, right? If you go in to the teacher and say, my kid is dyslexic, you can have a workup from a, neuro, a clinical neuropsychologist, and they're not attuned to it because there aren't any structures in place for routinely dealing with these kids who, by the way, um, are pretty common. I mean, there's a lot of them. Um, so, uh, so, so the ways of dealing with the kids in the schools are lacking. What, and, and, and you know, if you, I, I, I don't, the thing that I was, uh, I disagreed with you a little bit about was, I don't want to blame the teacher. It's not the teacher. It's the, you know, it's how we, it might be how we train teachers. It might be the background that they have. That person cannot be blamed for not knowing something that wasn't actually a central part of her training. No, I agree. I, I'm not. I, I hope I didn't sound so blaming the teacher. Yeah. I, I still think it's malpractice. 
the, the, the other thing is, you know, there's a lot of, there's a little bit of a football here, you know. Um, the pediatricians aren't so great on these issues either. It's not actually a central part of their training. Their background about developmental disorders is not up to date. And if you, again, I'm generalizing, and there are obviously going to be exceptions, but many pediatricians think that if the child comes in with a reading problem, that's an educational issue. And then there will be educators who think, well, uh, actually, if the child comes in with a reading problem, it's a medical problem. And so, you know, nobody's really um, t taking responsibility, and the kids are getting caught in, caught in the gap. I basically think there need to be things built into our educational system to deal routinely with such children, and we don't, we don't have them. Uh, that, that's a great segue into, into my question here. Um, I happen to be with one of those sketchy org organizations that you uh, highlighted at the end of your talk. Um, uh, it, it's not one that is computer-based, but is cognitive brain training. And a lot of the work that I did was with adults and kids with dyslexia, as well as other kinds of things. The person who started the chapter here was somebody who worked, was an audiologist and a speech pathologist in the schools here, got frustrated because the resources weren't there to work with, and it wasn't the teacher's fault at all, that the resources weren't there to help these kids. So the, but the model that we used was, and by the way, my PhD is in a tangential area. It's nothing to do with education or psychology. It's related to linguistics. Um, so the model is one of direct cognitive training in the sense of a, like a physical trainer or a tennis coach or something like that. So it's, a, it's this real intense one-on-one -on -one, um, muscle memory in relation to, to reading and so forth. The frustration that I have, first of all, it's not affordable for the schools to do this. So coming up with a model that would be more affordable and could be used in the schools, I think, is very important. Um, secondly, uh, I have a, a report here on one called CogMed, which is, I, I guess, one of those computer-based ones, which says, yeah, there might be something there, but what they claim certainly doesn't live up to uh, the, the results of the uh, assessments of the program aren't there. I think there needs to be more work on develop, figuring out what really does work rather than dismissing it out of hand or accepting it uh, as they purport uh, to get results. I think there needs to be more assessment and developing those kinds of things that do work. Um, so I think there needs to be more work um, all the way around and not push it off to the side. I get frustrated because I know I've had some very positive results. I know there are definitely some things in this that work. Um, there are other things that I'm, I'm not so sure of, but I don't see them, I see them doing research on their own uh, system that tends to support what they do. And I would like to see people outside of that actually develop the systems that work and do uh, more evaluation of it. So. I would guess that the U.S. has the um, largest and most powerful uh, reading re research and uh, cognitive neuroscience research enterprise uh, in the world. And yet, um, that little graph you showed, uh, places like Shanghai and Estonia and Finland, the kids are performing hours which leads me to wonder whether uh, all the research is really the, going to be the source of uh, our salvation. How, how, I, how is it possible that a country like Estonia has stronger readers than the U.S. when they, my guess is they spent a fraction on uh, cognitive neuroscience uh, <laughs> that we do? Um, we can talk about what those countries are doing well. Uh, we can talk about whether those things export are easily exportable to the conditions in the U.S. Uh, 
some of those things that are going on in other countries are not, are demographic and not uh, ones that we have, our science has anything to say about. Uh, I have, some of them have to do with the languages and rating systems in the countries, and some of them have to do with how you do the assessments. Uh, so I don't think there's any simple answer to that. Uh, it is possible for people to do a good job uh, uh, with educating their people, um, and some countries are doing it, and we're not. Uh, and uh, uh, certainly the suggestion is that uh, uh, it, there, are, there are ways in which, um, I think there are circumstances in the US that actually are somewhat different for which this kind of research is actually quite relevant. So for example, one of the issues that is very relevant here is that we are a heterogeneous people, and we have people coming in with varied language backgrounds. They are going to our schools and trying to do things like learn to read. So we have people who come in speaking different languages, and we also have many people who come in speaking different dialects of English. The impact of these different language backgrounds on the child's ability to benefit from the classroom is something that's extremely important. It's one of the things I'm studying. And uh, that does not arise in the same, so you might ask, for example, if the child is a speaker of African American English in the home and the community, it's communicative, it's fine, it's functional, it's, it, it's a dialect variation of the sort one sees all over the world in many languages and cultures. Then the child goes to school in which the language of instruction is standard American English. Some other countries do a better job of accommodating these kind of language differences than we do. The, child, the child's at a disadvantage. You could ask things like, will the brain science tell us something about how to time the exposure to these different sorts of languages or dialects in order to optimize their ability to learn? That might not be something that's as relevant in Finland it's relevant in Norway. They've got big dialect differences. But you know, I mean, so there, we, we, we could, there's a whole other discussion about what's going on in these other countries, and it's not one factor. I do think there are circumstances that are very important here for which the research is particularly um, relevant. I should say, though, the cognitive neuroscience of, educa of, of education related topics like reading and math, it's international. It is, it, it, yes, we do outstanding research here, but this is a very large community of of uh, people, and it does not depend on any one lab or, or funding agency or anything like that. So th those folks, some of the best research on reading and early language development, speech language developments, in fact, is coming out of Finland, where their kids' literacy rate is, you know, they're, they're always at the top or near the top. I just want to add a couple things to that. One is that, you know, if you think about, think about that chart, and Shanghai was on top. It wasn't China, it was Shanghai. So we're talking about a very particular city with actually a very high education rate. And also that in Shanghai, if you move from a rural area to Shanghai, you're not qualified to go to school. So the whole lower class of that city is not educated, at least not in official schools. So you know, when you look at those numbers, we're not always comparing apples to apples, as Mark was explaining. The other thing that I think is important to this conversation is, where do the professors of education in these countries go to get their education? Where in the world do people go? They come to UW-Madison, they come to America, because America has the higher education institutions around the world that are sharing some of this expertise. We're not the only place, but we're certainly one of the poor places in the world that people come to to learn about the science and the research and the work that's being done in education in general. So we don't want to lose sight of that. One last question. So my question is more uh, on a practical basis. When I think about um, what you shared about teaching of reading and all the many components, what is a parent to do when they receive the report from the teacher that says your child's having difficulty reading? How do you, does the parent then pinpoint what area to assist the child in? I think that's a huge issue because we've tended to treat parents as being very um, incompetent in a lot of ways, and I think this extends from lower class parents all the way up to upper class parents, is that, you know, we tell them, read to your child. Um, you know, do these worksheets with your child. Um, we, we do these very kind of germane things, and I think part of this goes back to what I was talking about before, is the teacher expertise on teaching reading, in many cases, is not there. So it's not there for the teacher to share with the parents, 
and teachers don't have opportunities in their days to do any kind of uh, really in-depth work with parents. And most of the uh, opportunities for parents to learn about literacy are targeting low-income parents, and they're doing these very basic kinds of often, um, often uh, reductionist ways of talking to parents. Um, they don't necessarily help parents to understand reading in the complex ways that I was showing you today. Although I think this kind of a presentation, if there, parents would understand this. I think there's ways that we could be talking to parents about it, but we need, um, we need resources in terms of time for teachers to be able to do this. We need teachers who understand this in its complexity. And I think this is one of the things that brain research can help teachers to do, is to provide um, rationale and, and evidence for this kind of teaching. And I think that's a powerful thing to tell teachers. See, there, there are ways of understanding this that relate to what goes on in the brain. I think that's a very compelling argument. And I think that if we create opportunities for teachers and, and parents and families to work in more authentic ways, that we could be doing more of this. But right now, I think well, the advice we're giving parents is, is probably insufficient. Thank you all for coming, and thank you, Mark and Kathy.